Welcome to Genomics Gupshap. Genomics Gupshap is an initiative by Map My Genome to create a community around genomics and to simplify genomics for everyone. I'm Anu Acharya, your host for this exciting Gupshap. And we are creating this community by bringing together experts from allied areas like medicine, genetic counseling, nutrition, fitness, and more. So please join us as we spread this word about this exciting science of genomics. We are now available on your favorite podcast as well. Just search for Genomics Gupshap on Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and Google Podcasts. And make sure that you also subscribe to our podcast as well. I know that we took a short break for the last month or so, but we are back with the 49th episode with Dr. Satish Madhiraju. He's a renowned cardiologist and an entrepreneur. He was in the US for over 20 years and has created uh, an app for heart, uh, heart health in, edu in India, educating consumers about heart health, right? Uh, so Dr. Madhiraju, welcome to Genomics Tapsha. Thank you, thanks for having me. So, so um, is it okay if I call you Satish and not? Yeah, me? yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, uh, Satish, let's start with your your childhood, and uh, you know, maybe you know what really got you um, excited about this whole science or or uh, getting into medicine and why cardiology. Yeah. No. It. Uh, I think mostly it's serendipity. One day, I remember I was walking with my grandfather and uncle outside our house in mm -hmm. Bangalore, and. Uh, just that morning, there was a newspaper article um, uh, about this famous cardiothoracic surgeon from Houston, Texas, at the Texas Heart Institute, who had then performed uh, a heart transplant uh, mm -hmm. with a mechanical heart. And then I'd read that article that evening. It just kind of captured, you know, I got enamored by the fact that you can actually take somebody's heart out and put a mechanical device in. And thus, that thought was born in my mind that, hey, I'm going to become a heart surgeon. And then sure enough, a few hours later, uh, you know, without any relevance to what I'd read that morning, they asked me, so what do you want to become when you grow older? I said, okay, I'm going to become a doctor because I want to be a heart surgeon. And then because many how, years how later, old were you? Sorry. I was in my sixth standard then. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe I was destined to be a doctor because I remember also when uh, one time we had gone to this place in uh, called Kanchipuru, which is all these old temples. And uh, we were uh, walking through one of the temples and there was an old Brahmin guy who was sitting, you know, you know, who's sitting on one of the, you know, table-like things. And then me and my dad were walking and he just called out from behind us uh, to my dad saying, hey, your son is going to become a doctor. So I don't know if he just said it, maybe he's a mad guy, I don't know. But in retrospect, when I look back, I feel like there was a lot of, uh, maybe I was destined to be a doctor, I don't know. And then a few years later, when I uh, moved to the U.S. to train, I ended up not being a cardiac surgeon in a traditional sense. Mm -hmm. But as luck would have it, as I was going through my cardiology training, um, as I was going through my internal medicine training first, there was a new there was a, a paper that came out in the New England Journal of Medicine about this doctor in France who had performed the world's first percutaneous valve replacement without opening the chest open. They had essentially carried a valve through the groin vein in that case, and then taken it up into the heart and implanted this in a person who was not eligible for open heart surgery. So then I said, okay, look, this is like, you know, essentially this is minimal invasive heart valve surgery. It was a new field that hadn't even been developed yet. Mm -hmm. So I said, I'm going to do that. So I essentially next few years, I went around the world and picked up the skills that you needed to actually practice a new specialty because then there wouldn't be any formal training programs. You had to just make a career out of nothing. And then over the next few years, I consciously traveled to Europe, traveled to other places to pick up all the individual steps that you needed to perform valve replacement without cracking the chest open. So I became a, what's called a structural heart interventionist. So when this valve therapy became commercially available, FDA approved, and the Medicare started paying for it first in the world in 2011, I became one of the first wave of doctors who were eligible to do this procedure. So I built a new career out of it, essentially, uh, we then ended up um, not only fixing the aortic valve problems with this valve, but repurposing the technology to fix other valve disorders, mitral valve, tricuspid valve, pulmonic valve. So I made an entire career out of a new procedure that came out and kind of developed along with me over the next 15 years. 
So you mentioned a lot of different valves, right? The, the um, mitral valve and all of that. Maybe if you can explain to, you know, how what what does an average person, I think the only thing people know uh, probably would be that there are four parts, like there are different parts in the right. right? chambers of the heart. Yeah, the think of the heart like a heart muscle. It's a pump. It's a, you know, it's a beautifully designed and efficient pump. Uh, in fact, if you look at the architecture of how the muscle makes up the heart, it's very unique. It's mm -hmm. muscle is actually wrapped around the heart in a very unique way that it actually generates force with each heartbeat. The four chambers inside the heart and between each chamber, there is a valve that regulates the blood flow. So blood will move from one chamber to the other as these valves open and close. So those are the valves inside of it. They all look a little different, but there are four valves, two on the right side, two on the left side. And all of these valves are subject to wear and tear over time. If you develop an infection, as you grow older, you will develop calcium buildup on these valves. So for one reason or the other, these valves can either become tight, narrow, that they don't allow blood to flow through it, or they can get damaged and leak backwards, which we call regurgitation. And typically, it can happen in young people, but a lot of these valve disorders just is from wear and tear of growing old enough that you now have problems. And they become life-threatening at a certain age that now you become old enough that you cannot have open heart surgery, and yet you only have a year or two to left. So this, so now what we can do is we can take robotic catheters and valves through different routes up into the heart from carotid arteries, femoral arteries, and go in and repair or repair them, and actually put a new valve inside of them without opening the chest. So those are the valves. But uh, the other other thing that people think about when we say valves is they actually confuse that with arteries of the heart. Mm. Now the arteries of the heart are on the surface of the heart. So they're like a tree in winter. As the tree, as the artery travels down the surface of the heart, it divides into smaller and smaller branches, carrying blood supply to the heart muscle because the heart muscle requires its own blood flow. These are the arteries that develop plaque buildup and get narrowed down from cholesterol, from diabetes, from growing older, and it is this plaque, when it ruptures, forms a blood clot and obstructs the blood supply to the heart muscle, causing a heart attack and heart damage. So valves are like gates of a dam. They regulate blood flow from one chamber to the other. The arteries are actually the tubes that carry blood to the heart muscle to nourish the heart muscle itself. So That's great. We'll come back to a lot more description in terms of you know, yeah. what happens with each of, of these things. But first, I wanted to understand, you uh, You did your MBBS from, from India. You were practicing in, in the US. Um, you have come back uh, to India. I think, you know, uh, how well, how has the journey been? How do you feel? Uh, is there a difference in terms of how we practice in the, in, in the countries? Or do you think that it is about the same? Yeah, no, I think um, uh, definitely India is good doctors, good hospitals, um, everything that you can get. Most of the things that you uh, can get in the rest of the world, you can get here in good hospitals, minus some certain very unique niche emerging technologies. You obviously takes time to come to India. I would say the one glaring deficiency that we have is the absence of a well-knit and thought out primary care system, mm -hmm. where we have to seek out a doctor because we have identified a problem. And therefore by design, we only go to the doctor when we already are fully diabetic or I already have heart condition. There's no essentially the absence of primary care system where everybody's plugged into a primary care office where I go to them once a year or once in two years, depending on how old I am. And this doctor essentially practices family medicine where they understand the guidelines. How should I preventatively take care of somebody who's 35 years old versus 45 years old? What screening test should they have? You know, when should I do an A1C test to detect diabetes on the person? None of that exists. Mm -hmm. So now essentially, unless you are wealthy enough and you are knowledgeable enough and maybe you yourself are a doctor or well-educated, then maybe proactively you might go and say, like, for example, after I turned 45, I knew that the guidelines had changed that for colon cancer screening, you had to get a colonoscopy now at age 45 and not at age 50. But I knew that. I read papers and guidelines, so I went and got mine a couple of years ago. But that wouldn't happen to a normal person, right? Because they wouldn't know what's happening. So I would say that's the glaring mm. uh, deficiency I, or the big difference between other developed systems versus ours is the absence of this family medicine primary care system. Yeah, I agree. I think I remember that uh, my uh, brother-in-law, 
who is a doctor in, um, in, in Rajasthan. And I remember that when my dad was in the hospital, because he knew everybody's history, he could exactly say what problem was there, not only with my dad or my, my or his brother, but he also knew the history which was there with his with their father as well. So I think you know that really helped in a lot of the you know diagnostics or even understanding what is going on. Right. And that knowledge, I think, like you said, is starting to come down quite significantly. So in many right. ways, I think family doctors could actually understand the genetics, uh, you know, without having to even do a genetic test if they knew right. the whole whole history or the whole family. But uh, uh, do you think that uh, that you know, in some ways, because of how we are conditioned, like you mentioned, that we are going to a specialist as soon as there's a problem that is diagnosed. Somebody who has a, a problem with diabetes or a, or heart disease goes specifically to to the doctor. I'm saying, do you think that there is a way that you can use genetics because that sort of helps you understand what your baseline is, uh, and then be able to go uh, and seek help uh, with with a, a a family doctor or or a GP? Do you think that there is a possibility that we can go that route or uh, for India, or do you think that we've gone too far on this specialist route there? I think it's possible as long as people have enough awareness mm -hmm. about what's available to them, what they can do. Uh, but in fact, I think a better educated family medicine physician can also use genetics in their practice to actually you know, figure out who's amongst the highest risk for developing certain sets of disorders, and then you know, specifically test them so that we proactively address their risk years ahead of time. Mm -hmm. uh, with the prior approach where I, as a consumer, figure out what I need to do, I think you have long ways to travel in terms of actually educating the masses mm -hmm. about how to go about it. So that, I would say, is a barrier, but I think that barrier is slowly being broken down now. Like, definitely now, when I compare looking at people 20 years ago in India, where I felt like you didn't see actually many people worrying about fitness or health, not mm -hmm. being so proactive now with post-COVID, I think this a greater momentum of people to actually take care of their health. You see a lot more conversations happening about health and fitness on social media and real and amongst people. So I feel like in the next probably five years, things will even be better where individuals will seek out these proactive screening tools to actually, uh, you know, take care of themselves in terms of figuring out what they're at risk for. Uh, but I'm sure there's some more road that we need to travel to get there. Sure. sure. And, and I think, you know, uh, lately, we've started seeing a lot more articles written in the media about, um, you know, somebody suddenly falling uh, right. in the gym or, or or things like that. So do you think that, uh, you know, people don't understand the difference between fitness and uh, health? And is there right. something that consumers need to know? What is the difference? You know, just because I'm running um, 10 miles a day, does that automatically prevent me from any problem in the, you know, like suddenly you yeah. fall down or or things like that? Uh, can you explain to us what the difference is between yeah, health yeah. and health? I think the fundamental misconception is they equate looking muscular mm -hmm. and quote unquote looking fit with being healthy or being cardiovascular healthy or heart healthy. Is that there is a very nice study that I often quote from back in the 1980s, where they took a bunch of young teenagers to early 20s, men in California who died of road traffic accidents. And when they performed autopsies on them, you already see minor plaque buildup within their heart's artery. So it's naturally natural evolution of as we grow older that cholesterol deposits already start to occur in our heart arteries. And because today an average Indian is at more risk for chronic conditions, the last statistics I looked at was 60% of adult Indians have some type of a chronic condition. We're more obese today. We're more diabetic. I heard 30% of adult Indians are pre-diabetic. Mm -hmm. So there's an epidemic of cardiovascular risk that's been kind of smoldering over the last 10 years. Is even though you look great and you look muscular, that doesn't mean you have plaque, that doesn't mean you don't have plaque buildup in your heart arteries. And we don't really specifically figure out who's at risk by doing whether it's genetic testing or other appropriate measures of risk screening tools that we have. We don't do none of that. And then people continue to exercise or take up new exercise programs without understanding the fact that they could be at risk for a heart attack. And that's essentially why this classic example, right? This famous 
I'm from Bangalore. I grew up, so I know Puneet Rajkumar, who was essentially my age. Uh, you know, very nice guy, very fit. You know, used to do somersaults at home in his home gym. And they're like, oh, how can Puneet have a heart attack? Yeah, you look great. He looked very muscular, but he also has a strong family history of heart disease. And he probably never had a screening test to figure out whether he had plaque in his heart's arteries or not, because if he did, maybe they could have understood what risk he had and prevented that from happening. So same story that every day, every week in newspapers, you see people dropping dead. Mostly it's the things that come in newspaper are either uh, movie actors who drop dead or something like that. And then everybody talks about it and then we forget about it a couple of weeks later and nothing seems to be done about it. I, I agree. I think there are many instances, I think people, it's more about fear at that point of time, but I think it should be more about, also about saying that maybe you can actually prevent because they say that you know I, uh, the statistics show that 80% of heart disease are preventable but you have to do that early right you can't just right. say that you know i'm going to um, you know run or 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 do something without even finding out what is going on in my body right now right? Um, but but i think that's 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 how the uh, the world is but i'm sure that there are ways to educate other than fear which is what you can generate right. when you suddenly read a news news article. There's a little right. debate about it. You are, you know, you. I remember once I, uh, I on Twitter, I think I made the mistake of telling people that maybe you should, when someone passed away, I don't remember now who, but saying that you know maybe you should be doing it earlier, screening earlier. And they said, how can you be so, you know, um, you insensitive. Know, <laughs> insensitive, right? But I was just trying to say that you know it is not about you know, this has already happened, but you need to make sure that the rest of us don't do right. the same thing, right? All of us have gone through some sort of a health journey in our lives uh, to understand. I think some some started earlier, some started later. But how do we get people to be more educated, right? How do we get them to do more, you know, understand their own bodies before uh, they get onto a journey which is a little bit harmful for themselves? Now I see a lot of news articles coming out of people who are dancing at a, um, at a wedding or uh, they were cycling and doing other things and dying of a heart attack. But now that COVID's happened and there is an underlying uh, perception that the COVID vaccine may not have been good and then maybe it's causing clots, I don't. You know, I think we're ignoring the elephant in the room, which is essentially Indians are at risk for heart disease. And uh, you know, you start to become active, you put your heart at stress, and you have risk of plaque rupture and heart attack. You know, many people, I heard conversations on social media where people were blaming the COVID vaccine for it. Maybe in some instances, maybe the vaccine had something to do with it, I don't know. Uh, but that's not the real reason why Indians are at risk for heart disease. We are genetically predisposed to, you know, to, to, to heart disease. Plus we have smaller arteries. We have a high predisposition for metabolic syndrome. So we have all the reasons to develop heart disease. And then you don't really try to get the proper test to figure out if you're at risk, then that's what's going to happen. You find out very late. And not they don't do a genetic test, but they also probably don't do some of the other basic tests that maybe will help you understand, right? I remember Correct. I did a, a, a cardiac CT to understand if there's any calcium deposits and all of, all of that. Uh, do you think that a lot of people are educated about that and uh, or doing just some sort of basic test once, let's say they're over the age of 40 or 45, and they have a family history. Uh, do you think there are enough people who know that they should come and get some of these tests done or that's still quite... Yeah, no, I think the awareness is very low. So last week, uh, you know, a bunch of us were traveling in Cambodia and one of my one of my friends is 49 years old. He's had diabetes for a long time. And I've been talking to him because I don't practice as a doctor here. I give public service announcements to groups of people I mingle with. I said, look, you got to get this CT test because you're diabetic, you're at risk for heart disease. And then finally, two weeks ago, when one of my friends dropped dead, that person was at my home uh, to get together. I said, Gaurav, if you're coming to Cambodia with me, you got to have CT, otherwise you're not allowed. Guess what? Two days before he's traveling, he has a CT scan. He's got a tight blockage in his main artery on the front of the heart. So even educated people, it's hard to convince them that, you know, even though you feel normal today, that doesn't mean that you don't have coronary atherosclerosis or plaque buildup, particularly diabetics, right? So guidelines say if you have diabetes, you should be treated like you have heart disease because invariably they're at the highest risk and most diabetics die from heart disease and not from anything else. And uh, uh, the guidelines say that if you have diabetes, most of these 
people with diabetes should be on aspirin to prevent plaque rupture, causing blood clot, causing heart attack. 33% reduction in heart attack rates from taking aspirin for what we call primary prevention. Nobody takes that. Second, there are certain classes of drugs you should take when, you're on, when you have diabetes to treat your blood pressure, to treat your other conditions so that your outcomes are better. That doesn't really get percolated down to the end person because they don't read guidelines, they don't go to see a doctor regularly. So you're right, I think that uh, when these events happen, there are people, doctors who come out and say that hey, maybe every, every Indian man over the age of 40 or has diabetes should get a CT of the coronary arteries Hmm. once every 10 years, maybe to screen for risk. Uh, but number one, awareness is an issue. Second is, uh, uh, does it make sense from a cost perspective at the population level? I don't know, but certainly I think it makes sense to do it. If you have those risk factors and you talk to your doctor, you can afford it. You can, you can certainly get it done. Uh, but how do you actually get the job done at a system standpoint when you don't have national guidelines or national recommendations directing payers to pay for it. Because in India, we don't have this system where actually payers pay for outpatient care and therefore guidelines don't get made. You know, people have to pay out of pocket. They're less likely to do it too. So I don't know how to kind of tackle that problem unless we evolve in our primary care system over time and our payment system also evolves over time. So in, in some ways, when I think about it, you know, um, if we are paying for our own health, right? I mean, in the end, as a patient or as, right. a, as a customer, and and I know this firsthand, my, you know, my I have a family member who went through a lot of, uh, you know, all the possible problems you can think of, um, four, three, four cardiac arrests, uh, stroke, um, cancer, all of all within a span of two years. And you can see that the amount of uh, money you spent, the amount of what the, what happens to your quality of life and all that is huge. And, and your financial burden is also quite significant. But along with that, you have all these other burdens that are there. But still, people don't understand the value of, of prevention, right? And right. I think that, uh, you know, that's why I feel that, you know, there is one that, you know, the kind of people that come and do a preventive test or, or, or others could be one family member of somebody who's already spent a lot of money in, in actually seeing what, what happens to a treatment, not just from treatment, but also quality of life, right? But uh, the second is the kind of people who generally want to look good and feel good. I think they also spend money in, in, in doing uh, genetic tests or, or other, other preventive tests. But um, and and in many in some cases, I think when the doctor recommends to them that you know this is what you need to do, or or maybe they are used to doing a, their employer tells them you know you need to get a blood test done, or the insurance companies tells them. But if we want to change the way people are thinking about their own health, is there something we can do from a education point of view? From uh, how do we educate? Maybe. Is there a possibility of saying, can we educate the educate like the doctors, or is there Correct. something that we can do from a national media coverage or something like that, which will be more effective than what we are seeing today? Right. I think in order to do it at the scale that you need to do to educate the large consumer base, that's to I think some amount of government involvement would be helpful because you need the money to actually do that at the big scale. Uh, what might be more feasible for smaller groups of people and companies like yours could do is to actually. Uh, educate the doctors uh, who have a good intent to help people, but certainly the guidelines. Are and we are back. Sorry for, for the interruption. Uh, so I think, uh, Satish, we were talking about, you know, people want to look good is a set of people. There are people who do it because the doctor asked, but how can we bring about like the large change in terms of how people think about doing these kind of prevention preventative tests uh is there are, are there any ideas that you can give us no i uh, i personally also had been thinking about uh, you know how do you improve heart disease awareness right for example and it takes me through thinking about how some of the biggest awareness campaigns were executed at a very high political level like for example if you remember in the us nancy reagan was involved in you know, say no to drugs, right? How do you educate kids about, uh, you know, saying no to drugs? And then how government took a role in educating people about uh, tobacco events, risk of heart disease and cancer. So I think at some uh, higher level, uh, 
government policy can allow us to spread awareness. Uh, it's, I think, a harder for individual companies and individuals to actually have that impact at scale. Uh, so I'm hoping that, uh, and I've seen how government is taking increasing interest in building primary care systems, increasing awareness about uh, you know people, people becoming healthy. So I'm hopeful that in the in the future down the line, that there'll be concerted efforts to increasing awareness about us taking care of our health better. Because frankly, it's directly related to productivity of the nation, right? So, you know, healthier you are and greater productivity that you can get from your population. Right. So, so you've been using some amount of genetic testing as well. Uh, for a lot of doctors, they don't, uh, they have not really incorporated this in a preventive form. So there are obviously some ways that they can do it on the clinical front, which is that, you know, you want to diagnose a, a particular mutation. But uh, can you maybe explain, you know, how you can actually use this from a preventive point of view? Yeah, we use it in a, in a few ways that are aware. So one is how do I really predict what an individual's risk of heart disease is? And there are, you know, certain risk calculators you can use. For example, the Framingham risk calculator it takes a set of data from your age, sex, what's your LDL cholesterol, what's your HDL cholesterol, what's your blood pressure. But that's a very rough number. How do you actually personalize the risk assessment at an individual level? And there's plenty of data to suggest that when you carefully uh, execute a genetic-based screening program to individuals who may be at higher risk, you identify uh, the core group of people on whom you can then um, attempt behavior change programs. Uh, because frankly, if uh, you know, I need something to jolt me out of that complacence, uh, so if I had data telling me that I'm an X percent of risk of having heart disease and you prove to me through objective data, such as genetic data, then I'm more likely to actually adhere to recommendations to work on those. Mm -hmm. And the risk prediction also becomes more fine-tuned. So what we do is we take, a, uh, we take uh, the Framingham data set and then we add the genetic data on top of that and then come up with uh, a risk assessment at an individual level of what their heart disease risk is. Is it low, medium or high? And those at the lower uh, risk percentiles or recommended care journeys within the app where they are advised to do certain things daily, weekly, monthly um, to improve their risk. And they're rewarded for that through points and we give them points, take them points, and they can exchange those points for discounts on health and wellness brands, Amazon gift cards, things like that. And those that are at higher risk are recommended to go see their doctor to get further risk assessment and whether it's a CT or a calcium score or something else. And then we found that that's very helpful in really figuring out who amongst this large group of people requires further risk assessment and who amongst them actually just requires lifestyle intervention, who amongst them requires further uh, strategies such as taking a statin or taking an aspirin for primary prevention. So when they are at the high risk, you mentioned CT, uh, calcium CT and a CT as well, right? Um, typically is that, I mean, you said when there are high risk groups, so is, if somebody had a, C, a calcium CT of zero, are they still recommended to do a full-fledged CT in under which circumstances? Yeah, so the you know the CT calcium score, I think, is like uh, a rough way of figuring out whether you have coronary atherosclerosis or plaque in your heart's arteries. But there are a few caveats there. The calcium score, as you know, simply picks up how much calcification is there within the arteries. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're picking up only the calcification within plaque. If mm -hmm. your general arteries actually become hardened over time from calcification, you'll throw up a very high calcium score. Uh, and uh, also remember that calcification is a marker of the fact that plaque has been around for a while. And typically calcification only happens when plaque has matured. And typically calcified plaque is more stable than vulnerable plaque, which is soft. And it doesn't show up on your calcium score. Really depends on, um, really depends on uh, the individual. And if that individual is at high risk for having coronary plaque or plaque buildup, uh, then the calcium score doesn't really give you the full picture. So in those circumstances, the full CT angel would allow you to figure out how much is the plaque burden, is there vulnerable plaque, is there soft plaque that doesn't get detected by the calcium score. So one, one more thing I was seeing that in our microbiome report, we also have the atherosclerosis, like the plaque filled up and the correlation with the microbial uh, density. Is that something that is uh, relatively, um, you know, 
is it new? Is it something that you feel is uh, an accurate, uh, you know, possible correlation with actual, uh, you know, it might be easier to do that than a CT. I don't know how mature that whole uh, field is, but do you think that that is uh, something that eventually will be easier to be able to understand if you have some sort of a um, calcification or or some hardening of the arteries? Might be, but I haven't really seen guidelines and data that suggest that we can implement that at a population level. So we're only using uh, recommendations from guidelines that uh, are there today. Uh, and therefore we just stick to the algorithm where if you're at low risk, you go through lifestyle intervention. If you're at medium or high risk, then we suggest that you get a CT or something else like that. I mean, I just happened to see it this morning and I said, you know, maybe it's something that, that yeah. maybe, uh, uh, you know, at, at some point of time might become easier from a correlation and causation or I mean, not causation, but more from a correlation point of view. The other area that I, we have seen a lot of cardiologists uh, look at genetic testing is the pharmacogenomics piece, right? Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, looking at drugs like clopidogrel and 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 others. Uh, do you think that uh, that's something, because it's relatively painless, I know one of the big challenges initially we faced was that the cost of the genetic testing was higher than the cost of the medicines. And right. therefore, uh, you know, they were, they were better off doing trial and error. But as the cost of genetic testing comes has come down, do you think that this become can become a standard protocol, or or is do you find value in in uh, tests like, you know, seeing if the drug is likely to work for a patient or not? No, absolutely right. It's you're personalizing because a lot of drug uh, therapy may be ineffective. Um, I'm not sure that the greatest value is in. Uh, using it for clepidogrel, now that you know that there are other antiplatelets available, which are much more predictable in their effect, like uh, uh, ticagliroral and others. Uh, certainly in, in the past, when our only option was to use clepidogrel, to, uh, particularly in post-stent patients, where they needed to be on a second antiplatelet. Uh, even with blood testing, where you're looking for platelet level analysis, there was wide variation um, in terms of their uh, response to clepidogrel, there it was very helpful. Now that there are other drugs such as uh, Ticagalor with the brand name Prolenta and many others, the drug response is much more uh, predictable and therefore it's less of an issue today. But certainly in other areas of uh, cardiology, for example, heart failure therapy, using statins and the right people who are likely to respond to it, and even selecting the appropriate uh, antihypertensive agent or other drugs which are likely to be effective for you is, 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 is certainly um, uh, a great way to personalize your approach to an individual patient. And like, you, uh, and, and like you rightly pointed out, in the past, it didn't make economic sense. Mm. Right? I mean, the cost of the testing was so high that it was kind of a mood point to kind of do it for a wide variety of people. But today with cost being so low, I foresee that going down in the next uh, few years that costs will even come down and the ability to test larger populations will go up. And I think data will come out saying that we're able to now personalize your therapy at an individual level to pick the ones that are most likely to respond. I mean, akin to what, for example, genomic testing in cancer can do to predict biological response to a certain drug in a certain cancer. Similarly, I think pharmacogenomics and cardiology uh, also will evolve to that. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I keep uh, telling people to get a profile done because you never know when you might need it, right? It's not that, you know, yes, you, when you're at, when you are 25 or 30, maybe you won't need any, any sort of medication, but maybe when you're 60 or 70 or, or uh, right. you might need it. So it's better to just keep a profile because that at least helps you in say, in working with your doctor to, to find out what might be the best approach for you. Uh, so we did the whole Medica map. So we said we'll look at 165 drugs and create a profile for them so that whenever they need at a specific level, they can always go back and, and look at it. It's not something you do every time. You're doing it once. So it was. I thought that would have been something that uh, makes makes a lot of sense for both the consumer as right. well as the doctor. And even if you were to kind of think about how if that data was available, let's say, you know, like in the US and elsewhere, India adopts a universal electronic health record and your data is actually up in the cloud somewhere on ABDM or someplace like that. 
And then that data is widely accessible for individuals when doctors are at the point trying to write a prescription, then that could be very helpful to, number one, you're gonna reduce the risk of side effects, increase drug response rates. And therefore, as a result of those two, you'll reduce your costs overall of therapy too. And also makes sense when, so some of these drugs are cheap, so it may not make sense. Uh, but if you look at the fact that you'll reduce side effects, that itself is a big win. And secondly, some of the drugs like heart failure drugs are very expensive, right? So if you can predict who's going to respond to it, you'll you'll have a lot of cost savings also. True. So, I, I mean, I, that's what I was telling some people, that it's not just about cheap drugs versus that's one part, right? right. But if it is causing toxicity in your liver, I don't think you necessarily want to, to go that route, right? Like, I mean, ultimately, I think this is the only body or only place you'll have to live in. So if you want to... Right. You know, why why subject your body to unnecessary uh, medication as well? You know, there are, there are lots of families that I feel that uh, need these testing, but, uh, you know, maybe because of awareness levels or others, uh, how do we, uh, can we, can we do this through the medical community? How can we make this, you know, more um, accessible to the doctors? Because clearly, I think some parts of that are, uh, are well known, but the other parts are not. So, from a uh, from a company like Map My Genomes perspective, you know, clearly we are we are making the products, right? Like we're making the tests. But how do we make sure that you know people who are at risk? And I think you mentioned that you know we can do government policies and others. But when you look at the medical community as such, uh, can we make changes within? I know it's not easy to make changes in the medical syllabus or others. But how do we make it easier for you know, uh, doctors to recommend these tests for those who need it. Like there are people like us who might need it for everybody, right? I mean, that's the the bigger approach that pretty much everyone can do with a genetic test for prevention. But there are many people who might need it for a real problem that uh, they should get tested for, but they don't. Um, how do we bring that awareness, right? Because this is the second level of uh, awareness where even people who need it and would have lived because of that are, are not taking these tests. Yeah, I agree. I think that's going to take a lot of work to uh, actually ensure that the medical community is well aware of the tools that are uh, okay. at their disposal today to be able to risk stratify. Um, and the other interesting thing that I was thinking about is uh, going the insurance route. Um, you know, life insurers and health insurers would um, now, as you see a lot of new insure techs coming out, being able to better predict an outcome in terms of what's the risk of hospitalization for an individual or risk of bad outcome, which uh, weighs heavily into how they underwrite premiums when they are covering that risk, uh, is being able to better predict through an advanced uh, mapping system. Like let's say you did a genomic test and now I have a better sense of who you are and what your risk of having a heart attack is, for example. Um, and I was at an insurance conference a, a few months ago, and it seems like maybe more than health insurers, life insurance, might, life insurers might be more inclined to be open to that data. Um, but I think also the consumer level, there is some level of comfort we have to give them in terms of data privacy. You know, they have to be counseled adequately after the test is done. And uh, the consumers also have to be comfortable that this data won't be used against them. Uh, as if there'll be declined insurance and so on and so forth. So I think there's a lot of work to be done there, but certainly if we can tie this into some incentive to the end consumer and also, let's say, the insurer, and both are to benefit from it, I think that'll be a win-win situation. Yeah, I agree. I think life insurance, for, for them, it's a completely well-aligned uh, model, right? Because you want you want your, your, your pay, I mean, consumers to stay alive longer and, and uh, the same thing when you when you look at it from a preventive point of view. Um, and today we are seeing some interest among the insurance uh, industry to be able to do that. But I think in general, I think there is still an uh, information asymmetry, right? So if you are a consumer, you can always access a test through, let's say, MapMe Genome, but an insurance company might not have access to that data, right? So right now, I think it's on the other side even though the worries are more on the fact that, you know, maybe insurance company will deny you. But I think the current laws in India don't, um, you know, you can't really still give different premiums based on, right? Because you're not really 
there's not a diagnosis many times, especially for preventive. So I don't know if uh, how the laws will evolve and how insure tech will evolve. But I think at this point of time, I think consumers are still at more of benefit than than the insurance companies. But particularly if you're aware, if you're able to uh, roll in other value added services like risk management or disease management to these individuals for whom you have full risk clarity, you could probably incentivize them through you know, free access to disease management programs and other tools to actually benefit the consumer in terms of reducing the risk itself. So, so you, your, uh, I mean, your approach to consulting a patient is very different. I mean, you are a much more uh, preventive based approach. So, how do you do this when you, you know, when you get a, you know, let's say somebody in their forties or fifties, maybe as in had. So, what, what does aware heart uh, do, and what do you do as a? Maybe if you can just explain that. Yeah, sure. So, our aim is to put the power of self-control in a consumer's hands, that they'll be able to use the application as a self-serve tool to get the risk assessment they need to figure out what's the risk of having heart attack and stroke is. Through a combination of uh, integrating your smartwatch and we take the digital biomarkers from your smartwatch and generate a score out of it, we'll plug that data into the traditional framing of risk model and then wherever the gaps are, we'll nudge the user to fill those gaps in. Like, for example, if the risk assessment is incomplete, then we'll suggest for them to do additional testing through our home blood test to figure out what that risk is. And then once that risk is well characterized, we'll guide them through what they need to do through a kind of a customized and personalized care journey for them. And our goal is to be able to not only make people aware of the hidden risks that they are at, through unmeasured cardiovascular risk, but also give them the power to actually implement lifestyle change from the comfort of a program, largely through, you know, through us, you know, we have a bunch of social features where people give you kudos, comments for things that you do that are good for your health, you're incentivized with points and disincentivized by taking points away from you. And, you know, people can uh, join challenges and compete with others to win prizes, so on and so forth. So that's, that's what we're trying to do is to, make it more fun and enjoyable to actually figure out what your risk is and then to reduce that risk. So, so um, in your own experience, uh, did you ever, I mean, you're a, busy, you're a busy doctor, were you able to always be as healthy as you were or did you have to yourself went through some, uh, no. some changes in your life? I was completely unhealthy until about two and a half years ago. And um, um, I was actually early diabetic I had severe hypertension. Uh, my diastolic bottom number was about 120. I figured that out when three, four years ago, actually four or five years ago, I was feeling dizzy and I got my blood pressure checked and was very high. So I was on two antihypertensive medicines and I had very high levels of cholesterol. And then over the last two years, um, I started to practice what I used to preach to others and literally lost 20 kilos of weight and started eating healthy and doing simple things, walking, jogging, cycling, things that I found enjoyable and I kind of do at least some activity one to two hours a day and I was actually able to reverse all of that I figured out that my A1C which was at 1.6.8 is now like 5.2 I no longer have I have perfect blood pressure off medicines my cholesterol is perfect so just with lifestyle intervention I'm not saying every diabetic can be reversed and I know a lot of people who frown at the fact that oh you can actually reverse diabetes uh, but I think for certain groups of people like me, where it was all caused by lifestyle and you're in an early stage of the disease process without any end organ side effects, you can actually reverse it to go back to where you were supposed to be. So that's been, uh, that kind of convinced me that I'm sure there are millions more people like me who don't actually need drug therapy. They need more awareness about what their risks are and and drive them towards behavior change to actually do things there that they can do every day to reduce the risk of having a bad event. Yeah, I think it's both the the most uh, cost effective, but also the most difficult thing to do. Yeah, yeah, very difficult because you know you know human beings we don't really look forward to the future. So if I don't have symptoms today, particularly like I find this uh, uh, as Indians, uh, it's hard to convince somebody to do something for a future benefit. Uh, and for them to do something today, it's like delayed gratification, right? Are you willing to put in the hard work today to gain a benefit down the line? But I see that changing. I see more people on the street today, jogging, running, cycling, you know, being more aware of their health. Certainly there's been 
uh, increased adoption of uh, fitness uh, post COVID. Uh, and I see a lot more fitness conversations today on social media than there were, you know, even three, four years ago. So I think it's all a, uh, it's all a positive change. So I'm sure in like five, six years, we'll see that we're a lot more health conscious than we were in the past. We have a small uh, park next to our office. And I think the moment MCH built the park, all of a sudden you saw, I see people coming in from one o'clock, you know, afternoons, evenings, every time. And I think that is so nice to see that, right. know, that there is something that uh, people are interested in, in terms of lifestyle changes. And even in between a work hour, I mean, working in the office, they're coming in to take a, a small walk or or actually do some activities. So I think that really brought about some change, at least in the vicinity that we are seeing over here. Yeah, particularly <laughs> younger people, right? Your younger employees that I talk to in my own startup, young people are more conscious about health yeah. and more conscious about eating right and exercising regularly. And that's kind of a very refreshing thing to see. Right. Uh, I would have imagined uh, something like that 25 years ago. When, when I first left India 25 years ago, I. I, you know, it was very, uh, only the older people who already had a problem were the ones you saw walking in the park. You know, you almost never saw young people doing things that you, you know, that you do today. Yeah, also, I think my daughters, for instance, they they are all aware about, you know, what food can do for you as well. Right. right? What food and, and exercise. And I think that's true of a lot of young uh, teenagers and, and slightly older. But I guess we still have a bigger problem to to deal with. Uh, in, in general. So um, I think we, we've discussed about, you know, where people can make a lifestyle change and others. Uh, but do you think that there is, there are some people for whom it might be necessary to actually be counseled on, on this in a much more deeper sense? Right? Like when you, there is maybe a genetic disorder or, or even uh, at a point where they need to make lifestyle changes. Do you think there is a role for genetic counseling in this whole um, you know, the process. So there's a doctor who understands the results, but there's also the ex effect of what does that genetic risk mean? Do you think there is a role for a genetic counselor in this process? Well, absolutely. I think it has to, every genetic test should be followed by a genetic counselor because number one, right? So doctors don't really have the time to read deeply into that and then counsel you in terms of what you need to think about because a lot of fears come into play once you get the test, right? This is going to affect my kids. I see some common questions come up. Uh, you know, there are some common narratives that pop up when you talk to individuals when they have a genetic test. And uh, you know, they worry about, uh, am I going to pass this on to my kids? You know, is this transmissible? And many other factors which are only alleviated by a proper genetic counselor who understands the genetic science to explain to them. Um, and I think doctors will do a good job of uh, once well-educated to include that data in their decision-making about how they are going to treat. But I think it's going to take a village to treat this individual. And even when it comes to lifestyle change and there's the importance of people other than doctors also that need to come into play, dietitians, nutritionists, lifestyle counselors. And it's going to take a multidisciplinary effort to actually accomplish the task. Totally, I agree. So, so we'll now move to the second part of our um, of this um, you know, discussion. And I'm going to ask you standard questions that I ask everybody. Sure. And I think in many ways, we've kind of discussed some of these, but we, we'll get uh, get to that again. So um, what is prevention according to you? Um, well, prevention is, to me, is doing things that are under your control today to mitigate a future risk uh, that's in, within your own control, um, not necessarily um, the expanded uh, definition of prevention would be you go to see a doctor and they prescribe certain tests and, medic and medicines. To me, prevention is, you know, to me, what I, what I should have done a few years ago that I ended up doing two years ago is really watching, you know, mindful eating, knowing what you're putting into your body and really exercising and doing all those things that you need to do to prevent a problem. And I look at it now um, as, you know, we put a lot of effort into financial planning and so many other different planning we do with, while not acknowledging the fact that your mortality, you know, is the final endpoint to all those plans. Like if you don't really 
prevent problems and plan on sticking around for a long enough time, then rest of all your plans go haywire. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm now fully invested in this concept of health span. How can I stay healthy long enough uh, that I can enjoy, you know, well into my 60s and 70s. So that's my definition of prevention. Totally. And I think what you've shown is that with with determination, you can you can make changes at later stage, but the earlier you do it, I think the, the better it is there for you from an overall risk reward perspective. Um, so the next question is, uh, what is um, your secret to healthy aging? Um, I, a um, few years ago, I found it very hard to do things I do today because I found a lot of them to be boring, like getting up in, at five o'clock in the morning to going to the gym. I think it's important as you grow older to kind of um, discover a passion that will allow you to not only stay fit and healthy, but also kind of bring up a new avenue of enjoying life. And for me, that's been travel. And a couple of years ago, I started doing trekking. And um, for example, uh, in October, I did the Everest Base Camp Trek. Wow. And um, that was a combination of fitness, you know, getting your mind to be strong enough that you don't give up halfway through climbing in high altitude, but also kind of enjoying other things that come with it, right? Camping, photography, and other things. So for me, and, and, and the second uh, activity that I've started, uh, you know, that I've fallen in love with is cycling, right? So so I've combined some, uh, you know, uh, what I needed to do, which is to become healthy, expand my life, to discover a new passion that will allow me to do things in my free time, travel, photography, and other things. So I think it, you know, it all depends on the individual person, but you're able to find something like that, that will allow you to, you know, tick two boxes, um, I think you can look forward to kind of being able to do that for a long enough time that, you know, you can age gracefully and, and be more healthy as you age. True. So you're, you shouldn't force yourself to do, uh, you know, just, you know, let's say so some people think that you only can go to the gym and do something right. or you can only do a, a, you know, running, but there are many other forms of physical activity or that right. hopefully if you find a passion for, I think it really makes it easier to... Yeah, yeah. because like most normal people, I find it extremely hard to actually motivate myself to get up and go to the gym every day. And there are days when you feel like, oh, geez, you know, because it's a easy, you know, you know, you know, give out, right? I mean, you can just not go. Uh, whereas if you like, for example, I set myself a goal that this July, I'm going to climb, uh, you know, another mountain. And I said, Kilimanjaro is my target this July. So wow. now I have a target. Now I know I have to travel to Africa and I need to get fit to do that. And, you know, I'll, you know, I'll, I like to camp and do things. So I've found that thing that drives me today that I can, you know, stay fit and also enjoy life as I grow older. So I, I recently met another woman. She, he, she started uh, climbing mountains after 45, 48. And now she's climbed all in all the seven continents. So nice. that was, yeah. So it was really seven summits. Did she do the seven summits? Yes, she did. So she's oh, wow. on the all the seven continents. So I think it's nice to see that you know people can make changes. And and she came from a, a family that was very traditional, very orthodox, you know, Marwadi family. Came out and and started doing this, and now inspires many more people to to follow that sort of passion. Oh. Right? How do you get to that uh, level of fitness, but also enjoy something? Well, it's it's kind of what you're you're also uh, doing, and so it's nice to see that. I think maybe I should start climbing mountains as well. Yeah, <laughs> and I think there are other things that you can do, like travel and fitness is is a great combination. And uh, you know, as I was going through the Everest Base Camp track, I you know you tend to become philosophical because there's like large mountains around you, and then you look around and you know you see poor Sherpa people who are like strong and they can carry 70 80 kilos on their back and they're listening to music and just bypassing you with you you know carrying just a five kilo backpack then i you know one of the things that i thought about was look if i didn't even have this level of fitness then there's an entire world that's outside my reach that money can buy right so i mean you can't just take an helicopter from Kathmandu and go to everest base camp you could but you'll only stay there for 2 minutes because you'll feel short of breath you're not acclimatized you you have to <laughs> climb your way right you can't really take an helicopter and go land on top of kilimanjaro you got to be fit so you know i started to think look 
I have to stay feel, uh, healthy to actually access a part of life and a part of the world that is inaccessible to even the richest person if mm -hmm. they're healthy. So, so basically, uh, if you're not healthy, there are certain things that wealth can't buy you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, and even, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I, I have a couple of, a bunch of friends who work uh, in wealth management and they all talk about, you know, the structured investment and all of that stuff. And, uh, um, you know, I, I joke with them, look, all of that's good, but compare this, right? So, let's take two people and they follow the same advice that you give them. If one drops dead at 60 and the other takes, uh, you know, lower risk bets in their investment philosophy, but is healthy enough that they actually live to 80. I mean, they've already done the job for them that longevity beats any other financial planning hands down because just by living longer, you make more money. I mean, even if you think about it that way, right? I mean, if you live 20 years longer, you're just going to make more money than dropping dead at 60. All right. Uh, so so what are the myths that about heart health that uh, you want to debunk today? You know, there's one big one. And I hear this often. Oh, I had a normal treadmill test. And uh, that's the biggest myth I see. Even when you actually want to get health insurance, mm -hmm. one of the things on your proposal form uh, is, uh, as a result of filling up that proposal form, is they ask you to do a treadmill. So number one, the treadmill test... Uh, you know, just like any other test has sensitivity and specificity, right? And it was really designed to risk assess you. Um, it's not a preventative test. You can't really figure out by doing a treadmill test that somebody has plaque in their heart's arteries. For example, let's say there are 100 people who have had a traditional coronary catheterization or angiogram, and we know that they have blocked arteries. If I take those 100 people and put them on treadmills, only 70% of them will have a positive test, which means that the 30% of those 30, 30 of those 100 will have a falsely negative test. It's a great way to risk stratify once I already know you have heart disease, mm -hmm. but it's not the right test to do to understand whether you have plaque and what measures I need to take to reduce your risk of having your heart attack. That's the biggest myth, a myth I see, even propagated by, even by doctors who don't really understand the science behind, you know, what test most appropriate for you. So it's incorrect test to actually risk stratify a large, you know, most people. Um, and because it doesn't tell you, do you do you have plaque in your heart's arteries? How much is it? How much plaque do I have? Do I need to take aspirin to prevent the uh, clot from forming when the plaque ruptures? Do I need to take a statin? None of those are informed by doing a treadmill test. In any other myths? I'm sure you've heard many. <laughs> Um, the second one's not a myth, but it's a frustrating lack of awareness mm -hmm. that today you see almost every other person you meet in India has diabetes. And mm -hmm. I get frustrated by the fact that, uh, you know, we don't really acknowledge diabetes, the status of what it should be, which is it's heart disease equivalent. Anybody has diabetes, you have to treat them as if they have heart disease, which means most diabetics should be on aspirin for primary prevention. Most diabetics have an LDL cholesterol target similar to as if you have heart disease, which is at least less than 100, perhaps closer to 70. Um, and uh, it's interesting how a friend of mine two weeks ago, I forced him to have a cardiac CT. And he said, you know, I'm glad you asked me to do it because we found out he had uh, an 80% blockage in his main artery, the LAD. And he was like, oh, I thought everything was fine. But I said, look, you know you have diabetes, right? But yeah, but my doctor never told me that diabetes can cause heart disease. Uh, it's unfortunate. It's not a myth, but it's a gross lack of awareness how seriously you should treat diabetes in terms of having, you know, uh, you know, having the right things that you need to do to prevent heart attack and stroke. True. I think diabetes is not just elevated sugar. Like a lot of my uh, right. relatives and others keep telling me, I'll just take a medicine, it'll be fine. And they don't realize it's systemic and it, it has definitely has a very strong uh, correlation with, with heart disease. Uh, but but that's, that's a, I think it's a great, uh, I mean, thing that people should be aware of that when you do have diabetes, you're very likely to, uh, to have heart disease as well. 
Well, there's a real myth that I get off, ask, get asked often, which is, oh, I see all these, uh, you know, they see the, an advertisement about laser or some tool they hear of that they can go into your heart's arteries and clean out your arteries uh, miraculously. And uh, that's a myth. Uh, we can't really clean your arteries out. What they're referring to is tools that allow us to prepare the plaque to accept a stent. Uh, but... Uh, and the uh, and people think that when we put a stent in, you're actually clearing plaque. You're doing nothing but using a metallic scaffold to push the plaque aside, mm -hmm. and you're simply transferring the plaque longitudinally across the surface of the blood vessel. You're pushing it out. You're not really clearing it out. Uh, and that's a big myth that I see where people feel like, oh, if I have plaque, I'll just go get laser, or I'll just go get a stent, and my plaque's all gone. And a related myth is that. Uh, putting a stent into a person who is asymptomatic, but with a blockage actually prevents heart attacks, which is completely untrue. And we know that from a number of studies, including uh, uh, several studies done specifically in this area, that prophylactic stent placement in an area of a blockage when you have no symptoms doesn't prevent heart attacks because there are other areas of the artery that has plaque, right? Just putting a stent in one area isn't going to miraculously mitigate the chance that that plaque can rupture and cause a heart. So there's no substitute medical therapy. Right. It's like a pipe and it's got plaque all over the place. You can put a stent in one spot, but you're not going to prevent rest of the plaque from growing or rupturing and causing a clot and having a heart attack. Right. So we move to the last part, which is the rapid fire. Sure. So if you could have only any one superpower, what would that be? Only one superpower. Well, one superpower. If I had one superpower, then I would make sure nobody suffers from a heart attack. That's great. Uh, and if you could eat only one food for the rest of your life, I know that as a as, as a you're not suggesting that, but what would that be? Sweet potato. Oh, nice. Okay. The the there is the blue one, right? The one that I read about in uh, or really? there's a certain type of sweet potato that is. Better than than the other. I don't know. Oh, I didn't know that, but I you know I like sweet potato because it's you know it's you know easily made edible uh, and it gives you complex carbohydrate, gives you starch, and uh, you know, and that's one I would choose. What is something that you want to do less of, and something you want to do more of? Uh, I want to do less of worrying about what's in store down the line and be more, more mindful of the present. I'm consciously making an effort to try to accomplish that, but it's very hard. But I'm making progress. I'm probably 50% there. Is to stop worrying about things that are not under your control, but to really enjoy the moment when you have it. That's, that's great. And what was your worst subject in school or college? <clears throat> uh, physics. Physics, okay. <laughs> I'm a physics major, so... <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's why I became a doctor. Biology is fairly simple in the sense that, you know, you read a textbook, you figure out how things happen, you go on rigid state, but physics needs real intelligence, which I think <laughs> I found it very hard <laughs> in school. Uh, but maybe it wasn't taught to me in an interesting way. I don't know. I think ultimately it's that, right? Like how, you know, who taught you and, and what, what happened, you know, right. how did you pick that up? So, so I think I've seen different set of answers from many different people and everybody is an, an expert in their field. So it doesn't matter. We all do well in one versus not in the other. Yeah. But thank you so much, uh, uh, Satish. This was uh, so enlightening. I think a lot of our uh, viewers will will truly enjoy, you know, understanding about heart health and also about, you know, what, what genetic testing and other preventive tests can help you and your journey through this whole process yourself. I think that is very inspiring and I think hopefully it'll get a lot more people to be aware about behavior change and, and changes in their fitness and others. So if there's any one more message that you want to give our viewers. No, thank you. But I uh, also want to give kudos to you and your team for pioneering, you know, uh, pioneering an accessible genetic product to the country. But I remember uh, many years ago, it was really out of reach of a common person to do a genetic taste, but uh, thanks to you, that now today I can just simply go online and order a test and it's fairly economical for a normal person to get uh, a, a genetic test. So I'd like to congratulate you on that journey over the last 20 years that you embarked on staying patient and being able to deliver that access to 
a large uh, population is truly a commendable effort. Thanks to you. Thanks, thanks so much. And but thanks again. Thank you. Bye.